Well, good afternoon. I hope you've had a good lunch and a little bit of caffeinated coffee and are ready to get back into Kierkegaard. My name is Bruce Longnecker, and it's my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, uh, who's been not only a colleague of mine in the past, but also a long-standing friend. Richard Balcom is the Emeritus Professor of New Testament Studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, from where he took early retirement in 2008 in order to dedicate more of his time to research and to writing. And it is true that he has, in fact, uh, written a fair amount of material over the years. Leaving aside his hundreds of articles, he is the co-author of four books, he is the editor of uh, eight others, and he's the author of, wait for it, 24 monographs, um, many of which are themselves quite lengthy. Uh, I collected this data last week, so it may already be out of date. So to say the obvious, his is a prolific mind. It is also a wide-ranging mind. Scholars often thrive in er ever-narrowing areas of specialization in which they can be the masters of a very small castle. Professor Balcom has done the opposite, probing deeply into diverse areas of specialty. Uh, these include the study of the historical Jesus, uh, the Gospels, canonical and non-canonical, the theology of John's Gospel, the Epistle of James, the Epistle to the Hebrews, uh, Jude and Second Peter, the Apocalypse of John, early Christian women, early Jewish Christianity, Jewish apocalyptic literature, the Bible and the ecological environment, and the theology of Jürgen Moltmann. <laughs> and if being prolific and wide-ranging weren't enough, it is also the case that Professor Balkum has been extremely influential in the theological disciplines and the life of the church. No area that he has addressed has been left unchanged by his contribution. And on many occasions, his writings have been game changers in setting the agenda of research and reflection. Obviously, I could go on to speak about the many prestigious awards and honors that have celebrated him, uh, or of the significant positions that he has held over the years. And obviously, we are honored to have you here, Professor Balcom. Uh, there will be time for questions and uh, comment after the paper. But my job now is to get out of the way and allow us to think along with Professor Balcom as he presents his paper entitled, The Mirror of God's Word, Kierkegaard, and the Epistle of James. Let us welcome then Professor Balcom. Thank you very much, Bruce, for a kind introduction. I don't think I had ever thought about Kierkegaard as an interpreter of scripture until I, wrote, I, until I wrote a book about the Epistle of James, which was published in 1999, and took serious note of the fact that James was evidently Kierkegaard's favorite book of the Bible. And since, as far as my knowledge goes, he is in this respect unique among major Christian writers across the whole of church history, I decided to give Kierkegaard a significant presence in my book. I featured his biblical hermeneutic, itself derived from James, uh, in my hermeneutical prologue to the book. I placed quotations from Kierkegaard, mostly about James, at the head of each chapter. And I discussed his interpretation of James at some length in my final chapter. There. I considered his appropriation of James on faith and works in the context of the Lutheran tradition and Luther's denigration of James because of his stance on this topic. That particular aspect of James has, I think, meant that much of the history of interpretation of James has been distorted by undue preoccupation with the issue of the relation of James to Paul. And so I actually warmed to the fact 
that Kierkegaard was unusually appreciative of what seems to me the unifying overall theme of the Epistle of James, which is the theme of wholeness or perfection as dependent on single-minded devotion to God. Kierkegaard devoted one of his finest religious works to this Jacobean theme, the, discu the discourse um, known as purity of heart is to will one thing. I also discussed the theme of God, the unchangeable giver of good, based on Kierkegaard's absolutely favorite text, James 1.17, and the theme of equality in neighborly love. I considered Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's penetration and appropriation of James um, to be profound and instructive, though I noted some limitations to it. When I accepted the invitation to give this lecture, I initially thought I would do something much the same as I did in the book. But really, I'm not fond of repeating myself. And in beginning to work towards this lecture, I found myself giving much more attention to Kierkegaard's uh, love of the single verse that seems to have led him to a broader appreciation of James as a whole. Chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no change or shadow of variation. The profound meanings that this verse had for Kierkegaard will therefore be the main subject of this lecture. But it will be useful to begin with the general approach to scripture that Kierkegaard drew also from his reading of James. So my first section is called Looking into a Mirror, Not at a Wall. Kierkegaard's fullest discussion of how to read scripture takes the form of a reflection on James 1, 22 to 27, where he finds in James's little parable of the mirror a scriptural image of scripture itself. He takes it to mean that reading scripture as the word of God requires that one look into it in order to see oneself in it, as one does when looking into a mirror. Now, the behavior that James uses the parable to criticize is hearing the word, but not doing it, for which he uses the analogy of someone who looks in a mirror, but then goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. Kierkegaard, of course, also wishes to say that true hearing of the word entails doing it. But only in the last section of the discourse does he discuss the danger of forgetting what one has seen in the mirror? Much of his exposition concerns a possibility that James does not envisage looking at the mirror rather than into it. This is typical of the way Kierkegaard can take a biblical image and extend it in directions that are not inconsistent with the biblical usage, but are certainly not directly implied by the biblical text. In this case, he does so because the problem of his cultural context, as he sees it, is that scholarly research on the text and academic discussion of the text all too often interpose between the reader and the Bible, making the text something to be considered objectively rather than the word of God addressing the individual in his or her subjectivity. As he repeats several times, to look into the mirror, to read scripture as the word of God, one must be incessantly saying to oneself, it is I to whom it is speaking. It is I about whom it is speaking. In another development of the image of the mirror, he puts it like this. If God's word is for you merely a doctrine something impersonal and objective, then it is no mirror. An objective doctrine cannot be called a mirror. 
it is just as impossible to look at yourself in an objective doctrine as to look at yourself in a wall. And if you want to relate impersonally, objectively, to God's word, there can be no question of looking at yourself in the mirror because it takes a personality, an eye, to look at oneself in a mirror. A wall can be seen in a mirror, but a wall cannot look at itself in a mirror. No, while reading God's word, you must incessantly say to yourself, it is I to whom it is, it is speaking, it is I about whom it is speaking. What one finds in scripture then is self-knowledge. This is the indispensable role of scripture. Can one not have self-knowledge without scripture? Only inadequately, because we are much too prone to deceive ourselves about ourselves. There is no proper self-knowledge without God-knowledge. Quote, to stand before the mirror means to stand before God. True self-knowledge requires God-knowledge, and scripture is about God as well as about ourselves, but it is not about God as objective doctrine. It is God's address to us in our subjectivity. This is, of course, why people avoid reading scripture in this way, or put off reading it in this way, while they busy themselves with the displacement activity of endlessly deliberating what the text means. To know oneself as a self before God is painful. It breaks down our self-deceiving defenses and requires us to admit that the self one sees in the mirror is the old self that must die. By the way, that characteristic use of the phrase before God in Kierkegaard um, does derive from the epistle of James. Not too sure how many Kierkegaard scholars recognize that, but I'm sure it does. In the rest of this lecture, I want to illustrate how profoundly Kierkegaard practiced this reading of scripture as an individual before God and its appropriation into life, not only in his advice to his readers in the upbuilding discourses, but also in the personal experience that lies not far behind the text of those discourses. In two of the discourses on James 1.17, we shall see that the unique importance of this text for Kierkegaard was deeply existential. I make no apology for adopting a partly biographical approach and even for making some one or two new suggestions about the details of Kierkegaard's personal story. But rather than the kind of psychobiography that has been something of a temptation for some people writing about Kierkegaard, I shall take Kierkegaard's story seriously as the story of a self before God, as he did himself. This is not a case where biography is irrelevant to understanding the works, though certainly the, um, the upbuilding discourses can be understood without reference to biography. But it's not a case where biography is irrelevant, if only because Kierkegaard himself deliberately left indications for posterity about the relationship of these works to his personal story. Moreover, I'm certainly not interested in reducing Kierkegaard's work, works to his biography, but rather in illustrating that when it comes to the appropriation of scripture, he knew what he was talking about. I find the power of the upbuilding discourses to be more compelling as the extent to which he knew very profoundly what he was talking about becomes evident. After all, they were written for Regina, whom he hoped of all people um, to understand what he was talking about. So James 1.17 and Regina. It is well known that the two upbuilding discourses of which the second is Kierkegaard's first exposition of James 1.17, were addressed to Regina, who at this stage of his writing is the single individual to whom his preface refers. Moreover, Kierkegaard knew that she did read this work, 
Eight years later, in May 1851, he preached a sermon on James 1, 17 to 21, the lectionary epistle for the day, the fifth Sunday after Easter, noting in his journal that he decided to expound this, his first and beloved text, with Regina in mind, and with the thought also, he writes, whether it would give her pleasure to hear me. We do not know whether she attended, but when he wrote a preface for the published version of this sermon in 1854, intending it to be his last published work, he wrote, if a person were permitted to distinguish among biblical texts, I could call this text my first love, to which one usually returns at some time, and I could call this text my only love, to which one returns again and again and again and always. The three agains here match the number of discourses on this text that Kierkegaard had in fact published, including the present one. But the phrase, my only love, which, which, which he could hardly have used of the biblical text if that were all he had in mind, was there really no other text that Kierkegaard loved, betrays the fact that he virtually identified this text with Regina. He evidently decided that this was too obvious, although no one at the time suspected his continued devotion to Regina, and the preface as published was a much more sober version. This text is the first one that I have used. Later, it was used on several occasions. Now I return to it again. However, the most revealing journal entry with regard to Kierkegaard's association of this text with Regina is from the year after his sermon in the Citadel Church, written on the corresponding Sunday of that year, 1852, when once again, James 1, 17 to 21, was prescribed as the epistle. Despite his poor opinion of the preacher, used Pauli, Kikur attended the castle church. Regina was there and sat near where Kierkegaard was standing. Though Pauli might have been expected to preach from the gospel for the day, in fact, he chose the epistle. And when he read it out, Kierkegaard says, Regina looks towards me very fervently. I looked vaguely straight ahead. The first religious impression she had of me is connected with this text, and it is one I have strongly emphasized. I actually did not believe that she would remember it, although I do know from Siburn that she has read the two discourses of 1843 where, where this text is used. So on Wednesday, she nodded to me, and today the text, and she is aware. I confess that for me too, it was somewhat jolting. Pauli finished reading the text aloud. She sank down rather than sat down. Pauli begins to preach. I believe I know Pauli fairly well. It is inexplicable how he came to think of such an introduction. It may have been intended for her. He begins, these words, all good gifts and so on, are implanted in our hearts. Yes, listeners, if these words should be torn from your hearts, life would lose all its value uh, for you, and so on. I seemed to be standing on thorns. For her, it must have been overwhelming. I had never exchanged a word with her, but here it seemed as if a higher power was saying to her what I had been unable to say. This incident is only explicable in the light of the way that Kierkegaard applied James 1.17 to himself and Regina. As we shall see, he read the text to mean that everything is a good and perfect gift from God when received with humility and trust. He applied 
uh, he applied this to the ending of his engagement to Regina and the suffering that it caused them both. His own appropriation of the text is, uh, in that sense, had been decisive for the way that he himself dealt spiritually with this trauma in his life, and he evidently very much wanted Regina to come to see her suffering also in this light. Indeed, he had tried to communicate this to her in his 1843 discourse on this text. The preacher, Pauli, must surely have read this discourse because he follows Kierkegaard's distinctive interpretation of verse 21, taking the implanted word of that text to be the words of verse 17 about every good and perfect gift. But is it of Regina's reading of this discourse that Kierkegaard is thinking when he says that her first religious impression of him was connected with this text in James? This can hardly be right because he had certainly spoken to her of religious matters in the period of their engagement. It must have been the significance this text had for them at that time that Kierkegaard had hoped, but actually did not believe, she would have remembered. In the journal entry of 1849, in which Kierkegaard uh, said that the two upbuilding discourses published in 1843 were intended for Regina, he mentioned, among things that would have been significant for her, the date of the book. The book was published on the 16th of May, 1843. Why should this date be significant for Regina? In 1841, when Kierkegaard and Regina were still engaged, the 16th of May was the fifth Sunday after Easter, for which the prescribed epistle was James 1, 17 to 22. I suggest it was then that Kierkegaard discussed it with her. This was three months before he returned his engagement ring. Perhaps it was on the 16th of May, in connection with the text from James, that he first spoke to her about his growing conviction that they should break off the engagement. Perhaps he first suggested then that, the marriage, that their marriage might not be, as they had assumed, a good and perfect gift from God. If so, this would have made the text all too memorable to Regina. That Kierkegaard himself associated this text with Regina at an early stage of their relationship is reasonably clear from another journal entry where he says, I once prayed to God for her as a gift, the loveliest. For a moment, when I also glimpsed the possibility of a of consummating a marriage, I thanked God for her as a gift. Later, I had to see her as God's punishment of me. Here we begin to see what Kierkegaard meant when he said that his relationship to Regina was a God relationship. First, she was God's good and perfect gift to him in accordance with his own desire for the happiness of a worldly life through marriage. But this self-interested reading of the text had to give way to a new reading of it, the other side of dying to self, when the pain of renouncing her became his punishment, and the punishment really God's good and perfect gift to him. The first discourse and the broken engagement. In his first discourse on uh, James 1.17, um, we shall see both how deeply Kierkegaard had appropriated this text in his own experience, and also how this was connected with very careful attention to the text in its context. Uh, that is, verses, um, uh, sorry, in, in its context in chapter one. Although the portion of the text of James printed at the head of the discourse uh, 
um, that is 1, 17 to 21, follows the division in the Danish church lectionary. Kierkegaard, in fact, interprets verse 17 in close relationship to the preceding verses, 13 to 16, as well as the succeeding ones, 18 to 21. And so I've given you that whole uh, passage on the handout. Kierkegaard takes for granted that verse 17 is the key verse within this whole passage. And he takes the words of this verse to be the word to which verse 21 refers back, the word that is implanted in you and that is powerful for making your souls blessed. This is not an interpretation to be found in modern commentators, but it is not arbitrary. Verse 21 exhorts its readers to, on the one hand, renounce all wickedness, and on the other, to welcome the implanted word. If the wickedness refers back to verse 15, then verse 17, which Kierkegaard read as the antidote to verses 14 to 15, can be aligned with the word that is to be received according to verse 21. In any case, identifying verse 17 as the implanted word of verse 21 both highlights verse 17 um, as the key saying in the whole passage and reveals how readers are to appropriate verse 17. They are to receive it with meekness and then it will prove powerful to bless their souls. Kierkegaard aims in the discourse to show how verse 17 should be appropriated rightly with its conse consequent blessing. As well as considering verse 17 forwards, um, connecting verse 17 forwards with verse 21, Kierkegaard also connects it backwards with verses 13 to 16. These verses refer to one's own desires as the source of temptation. To tempt God, Kierkegaard supposes, is to expect God to fulfill these selfish desires of one's own. But God cannot be tempted. We shall learn instead to, uh, sorry, we must learn instead to renounce these misguided desires of our own which verse 16 treats as self-deception, and accept that what God does give us is what he knows to be best for us. Therefore, if we read verse 17 as referring to what we think are good and perfect gifts, we are misreading it according to our unregenerate nature, whereas it should be read in accordance with the dying to self and the rebirth to a God-centered life that verse 18 refers to. Kierkegaard's understanding of verse 17 is summarized in the following paraphrase of the verse. Just as God's almighty hand made everything good when he created, so he, the father of lights, ever constant, at every, in, at every moment, makes, ev makes everything good, makes everything a good and perfect gift for everyone who has enough heart to be humble, enough heart to be trustful. This interpretation that everything, um, comes to, everything that comes to one in life is a good and perfect gift so long as one accepts it with receptivity to God and trust in God is also supported by the connection uh, verse 17 makes between God's gifts and his changelessness. There would be no point, Kierkegaard reasonably argues, in referring to God's changelessness if he only bestowed good gifts from time to time to this or that person. In contrast to a changeable world in which we experience both joy and sorrow, God's relationship to us is constant provided we keep our eyes fixed on this divine constancy, instead of being swayed by our changing experiences of life, he will prove constant in making everything his good and perfect gift to us. Only when we suppose our own desires are indicative of what is good for us, 
will we suppose that God is other than constantly good to us? But to experience everything as God's good gift, we have to repent of our own wishes, accept that actually, uh, actually being denied those wishes is a good from God, and learn to receive everything in life as from the hand of God, humbly and with thanksgiving. Appropriated in this way, the words of verse 17 are, he says, a commemorative coin more magnificent than all the world's treasures, and also a small coin that is usable in the daily affairs of life. In the discourse, Kierkegaard explains uh, his interpretation of verse 17, but assumes much of the explanation of the surrounding verses that I have given you, merely referring to the connections he makes with the other verses as though they were obvious. In other words, his own work in understanding the passage lies behind his text rather than um, most, most of, mostly in it. Um, and I do want to stress that if you read these upbuilding discourses uh, superficially, it can look rather as though he uses the text as a sort of hook to hang his reflections on. In fact, he works hard at analysing and thinking about the texts in their uh, exegetical connections with their context and with other parts of scripture very often. However, it does come as a surprise when Kierkegaard claims that the words of verse 17 are so comprehensible, so simple, that is, so clearly mean what he understands them to mean, that it is only doubt that persuades people to think otherwise. However, the art of the discourse lies not in the exegesis as such, but in the way that Kierkegaard shows his readers how, starting from where they are, they may come to appropriate in their lives the true meaning of verse 17. He envisages several categories of people. The first category, the happy-go-lucky people who live on the surface of life, content with their fortunate lot, he does not actually address, since if their attention were directed to the text of James, uh, they would see no reason to give it more than passing attention. The second category, those who sorrow over the troubles in their life, find the text consoling and strengthening because it gives them hope that God will give them good gifts, but they are constantly disappointed. It is at this point that the discourse turns into a second person address to my listener. And Kierkegaard professes to speculate about what this person would have thought. The listener, he imagines, fixed all their hopes on just one special wish, so important to them, that it would be sufficient to show that all good and perfect gifts do come from above. Quote, with humble prayers, with burning zeal, you tried, as it were, to tempt God, but in vain. As he continues to tell the putative story of this listener, Kierkegaard imagines them repenting of the fruitless search for the fulfillment of their own wishes and humbly accepting instead that God's denial of their wishes was actually a good gift from God because through this denial, he gave them something much more valuable, that is, an authentic faith. By taking the story to this happy conclusion, Kierkegaard is not supposing that he is necessarily addressing a listener who has reached that conclusion. It is flattering rhetoric um, to put it in this way, but the story can function as a guide to any listener who may be currently at any point in the story. It shows them the way to reach the end of the story through appropriating the true meaning of James 1.17. The listener is a type, not a particular individual. But I think it is very plausible that Kierkegaard hoped this passage would speak to Regina, who had been disappointed in her fervent desire for their union. It is precisely at this point that Kierkegaard inserts the passage that he said in his journal 
was a hint to Regina. It clearly recalls the crisis over the engagement. And I think its function at this point is to invite Regina to see her experience of the end of the engagement as a key event in her God relationship, as Kierkegaard saw it in his own case. Kierkegaard now imagines a different sort of listener, one whose reaction to suffering and unanswered prayer is not humble pleading, but angry defiance. He shows the way that this person too can come to appropriate the real meaning of the text from James. There may be something of Kierkegaard's own experience in this portrait. But in our limited time now, I want to move to the much more clearly autobiographical passage towards the end of the discourse, where Kierkegaard addresses someone who perhaps thought that punishment from God is also a good and perfect gift. We know from the journal entry I quoted earlier that this is precisely how Kierkegaard thought of his suffering over the end of the engagement. But, he says here, quote, the punishment you suffered was different from what you supposed it would be. Perhaps it involved more than you, and yet you were the guilty one. Punishment this person would accept, believing they deserved it, but, quote, this more that was attached to it, attached to the punishment, was this too a good and perfect gift. Tempted to believe that God is not love, but nevertheless clinging to the words of this text because, quote, to let them go was far more terrible than anything else. This listener won through to the realization that, quote, repentance is a thanksgiving not only um, for punishment, but also for the divine decree, and that the person who in his repentance only wants to suffer punishment will not, in the deepest sense, love according to his own imperfection. Kierkegaard had foolishly supposed that ending the engagement would bring suffering only to himself, and was prepared to accept this as punishment for having pursued his own wishes up till then. In struggling, um, in struggling to come to terms with the fact that others, especially Regina herself, suffered too, he nearly lost his faith in a God of love, but maintained it by holding on to this key text. It taught him that he could receive God's perfect gifts only in a way that corresponded to his own imperfection. His repentance had to be more than a willingness to receive punishment. It had to be God's own gift of the knowledge that God loves us much more than we can love him. Exegetically, this is a move from understanding God's good and perfect gifts as only what happens to us, to understanding them also as what God does in us, a move we might say from providence to grace. The biographical dimension cannot do full justice to this discourse, but it can show how the existential depth of the discourse not only derives from Kierkegaard's experience, but from the painful and profound interpretation of the scriptural word that accompanied and directed his traumatic spiritual journey. The second discourse and the fallible father. One remarkable feature of Kierkegaard's four discourses on James 1.17 is that they are all completely different in their themes. The second focuses on the fact that the verse refers to God as the Father and shows how far his giving of good, how far his giving of good transcends that of a human father. At this point, we should remember that not only are all the discourses addressed to Regina but they are also all dedicated to his father, who had died in 1838, with whom Kierkegaard had a notoriously complicated relationship, with which he engaged throughout his life, just as he did with his devotion to Regina. Exegetically, um, Kierkegaard's appropriation 
um, Kier sorry, Kierkegaard's approach in this discourse is to read James 1.17 intertextually um, with the saying of Jesus, um, which you have on the sheet. Can't just find it. You have it on the sheet. Uh, both in Matthew's version, um, he initially quotes it from Matthew, but he also later exploits the variant in Luke's version. Um, he focuses on the comparison that this saying makes between a human father and the father in heaven. Without explanation, he introduces a representative figure called the troubled one and the concerned one who progresses through three stages of understanding the saying. It is a rhetorically effective device that should not be reduced to autobiography. But Kierkegaard's own relationship to his father on earth and his father, on, father in heaven can easily be discerned in it. To the concerned person, that is, to the person concerned about his own small task in life, quote, what better words could be addressed than these words, which are so childlike, which he himself to a degree always is, reminiscent of life's first unforgettable impression, reminiscent of a father's love for his child. At this stage, the character was content, uh, was, was content with the simple analogy between God and his own father. But he did not realize that, quote, these words, like all sacred words at various times, can be milk for children and strong food for adults, even though the words remain the same. In this profounder interpretation, instead of earthly matters forming an analogy to divine things, Kierkegaard says actuality, the relationship is reversed so that actuality also began to explain to him the metaphors of earthly life. The second phase, this second phase of understanding the text began when the character was older and, quote, everything was changed, shaken by a terrible upheaval. God pronounced another judgment, that even the human being who nevertheless was the most perfect creation, that even he was evil. Primarily, this means that the character now takes account of the word evil, in Matthew's text, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. But the terrible upheaval is surely strongly reminiscent of the great earthquake or frightful upheaval to which Kierkegaard refers in a famous and endlessly debated autobiographical fragment about his father, and which he says, suddenly pressed on me a new infallible law for the interpretation of all phenomena. Kierkegaard learned something shocking about his father, which, whatever it was, shattered the ideal of the pious and disciplined man he had previously entertained. In the discourse, the terrible upheaval is a kind of eating of the tree of knowledge and good, of good and evil, which entirely spoils the analogy between the giving of good gifts by the, by the earthly and the heavenly fathers. Quote, if, he th the character then said, God's love does not know how to give good gifts any better than a father's love, then there certainly is small comfort in these words. Fatherly love now suggested to him only the, uh, only the best in, but also the weakness of the human being. The image is no longer innocent and the words of scripture now seem only to condemn human life as evil. Even when people wish to give good gifts, the gifts may not actually be good. Quote, so there is nothing good and perfect in the world. A sentence through which Kierkegaard slips in an allusion to his main text in James which says, in fact, precisely that no good or perfect gift originates in this world, but all come from above. 
Kierkegaard thus leads his character on beyond the second phase of doubt uh, to a new phase of understanding the text, one that brings it into line with James 1.17. We could call this third phase an appreciation of transcendence, a realization that the transcendence of God's goodness beyond all human good, such that God can be called the only good, is, quote, the one blessed thing, both in time and in eternity, in distress and in joy. Now, the metaphor, the comparison of the earthly and heavenly fathers in Jesus' saying, vanishes, and the words say only what the apostle says, that every good and perfect gift is from God. There is, of course, a similarity between father's love, father's love and God's, but the father's love is, quote, never so strong, never so inward, and therefore is not capable of doing what God's love is capable of doing, which is the power of its love, which, which in the power of its love is Im almighty. But it is as though the analogy, having served its purpose, can then be discarded as it is in the saying of James, who speaks only of the Divine Father, from whom alone all truly gifts, truly good gifts come. Once one realizes the qualitative difference between God's giving and human giving, one must do without the metaphor. The rest of the discourse explains what makes God's giving truly good. It is, for a start, because God alone gives the condition for receiving the gift, along with the gift. He does not, as it were, take leave of the gift as he gives it, but in giving already has given. But finally, the good, God, uh, the good that God gives is himself. The good that he is, as the Lucan version of Jesus saying, which replaces good gifts with the Holy Spirit, makes clear. In the course of the lengthy exposition of how God gives, Kierkegaard includes exegesis of James 1.16, according to which God brought us forth by the word of truth, making us a first fruit of the new creation. He interprets this to mean that in order to receive the good from God, there needs to be an entirely fresh beginning which God, of his own accord, uh, effects in us, or better, in the single individual. In order to make it possible for us to receive the good, God awakens in us the need for the perfect gift from God. But this need can only awaken when, in a great upheaval, the earthly analogy proves useless and is abandoned. In the journal entry, Kierkegaard wrote, my father died, then I got another father in his place, God in heaven. And then I discovered that my first father had really been my stepfather, and only in an unreal sense, my first father. This seems to be a way of saying that although relating to God by analogy with his earthly father was appropriate for a child, he could only relate more maturely to the transcendent father, the qualitatively different father, when the earthly, earthly analogy was taken out of his life. Then the analogical direction reversed. The discourse combines intimately exegesis of Kierkegaard's favorite text, a wide-ranging exploration of the nature of gift, a hermeneutical account of how biblical images of God work, a theological and philosophical account of divine transcendence, an argument with doubt, and a reading of his own experience of his father as a God relationship through which he progressed painfully to come to know God as other than the image of his human father. Finally, I do not have time left to discuss the third discourse on James 1, 21, or the sermon on the same text. They are once again strikingly different from the first two discourses and from each other. 
Kierkegaard persisted in pondering the text that had come to mean so much for him until it yielded further fresh insights and duties. In the third, in the third discourse, he expounds the equality of all persons in giving and receiving of gifts in consequence of the fact that human giving and receiving are themselves both among the good gifts from God. In the sermon, he focuses entirely on the second half of the verse, the description of God as the father of lights with whom there is no change or shadow of variation. I think it could be shown that these themes Kierkegaard also appropriated in his own life. Thank you. Well, we do have some time for questions, so who will be first? Uh, you know the drill, make your way up to the microphones and we'll uh, take questions from there. So. Don't be shy. <laughs> The absence of a better question. I should like to ask, uh, as a person who is not a Kierkegaard scholar, whether you know if Kierkegaard was familiar with the work of Bonaventure, Saint Bonaventure, uh, the medieval philosopher and theologian, for whom the same verse was the preeminent verse in his life, and, and who used it as the incipit to a work, uh, De Reductione Artium ad Theologiam, the retracing or or redirection of the arts to theology, we might say. And, 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 and the, the reason I ask the question is this. For, for Bonaventure, amongst the lights of which he identifies four, at the bottom, the, the, the light of sense experience, and at the top, the light of grace and sacred scripture, he is really articulating a kind of itinerarium or progress, right? But his notion you appropriate James 1, 17 to 21 is being Bonaventure is exemplarist. In other words, he's saying this is not so much an argument. We do not approach this thing as a philosophical argument. We see it as an exemplar which we imitate. So that the only way of appropriating a biblical text for Bonaventure is by imitation, imitatio which strikes me as having an accord with some of the things that you are saying about Kierkegaard's way of exegeting James. And so I just wanted to know whether you, in your experience of Kierkegaard, have found any evidence that he has read this kind of background text. Uh, thank you. That, I mean, that's fascinating. I, I didn't know that that text was so important for Bonaventure, and I must look at his work. Um, uh, I, I really don't know where, I mean, I. I I don't think it's very likely that Kierkegaard knew Bonaventure's work, but I, I don't know. Some Kierkegaard scholars here may know much better than I do. But thanks, that's a very interesting comparison. Well, I also had uh, a question with regard to who, who uh, seems to be helping Kierkegaard re read this way. That's one sort of question I have, and so it sort of points in that way. And then Is there a relationship between mm. receiving gifts meekly and gratitude? Mm. Um, to take the, the second point first, um, yes, there is. I think there's a strong relationship in Kierkegaard. I, I didn't perhaps have time to bring it out, but uh, yes, he, he sees meekness, which is, you know, humble receptivity. It's receiving things as gifts from God must uh, I mean, he almost says it is thanksgiving, it is gratitude. It's certainly, you know, it's, it's the, they coincide, I think, in experience. Yeah, that's very much the case. Um, as to the influences on Kierkegaard's reading of James, I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I, I really haven't explored the literature that he might have read. Um, 
I mean, Kierkegaard simply does not think much of the biblical scholarship of his age. You know, he thinks it's this business of, you know, um, devoting all your time to, to discussing what the text means rather than hearing the text. Um, and I would not be surprised if his interpretation is based no more than on looking hard at the text himself. I mean, this is clearly what he does. Um, he's a close student of the text. Um, he thinks about the text, the words, the connections, and so on. Um, he is actually, I think, um, a little bit misled, perhaps. Although, though, I mean, Kierkegaard had learned Greek. I don't think he looked at the Greek when he did this kind of work on the text. And he might have had to do things a little bit different if he weren't reliant uh, purely on the Danish uh, translation. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, the short answer is I don't know what he might have read about James. I mean, he may have read sermons. I, I, I really don't know. I'm not a Kierkegaard scholar in, in that sense to, to know those sources. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if he simply read the text and, uh, and thought very hard about it, and that's what came out. I have less of a question and more of a response, but I, I was I so appreciated your presentation. Um, I'm interested in psychology, and um, what that's about, in, 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 well, it, thought of therapeutically as the word of God entering the soul and healing the soul. And you gave us a wonderful way of, of thinking about it, the word of God in the heart of Kierkegaard you know, the, this great psychodynamic Christian theorist. Um, and, 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 I, and I wanted to respond by, uh, I just finished this massive biography on uh, Kierkegaard written by a fellow named Garf. Mm, yeah. It's uh, his first name. Get a bit closer to the mic. People are trouble, having trouble oh, hearing okay. this. Okay. Uh, I just read a biography, uh, a massive biography of Kierkegaard by a fellow named Garf. I can't remember his first name. It's somewhat notorious, as I understand it, by people who know Kierkegaard better than I. But it's very psychological. Um, and as I made my way through it, um, as particularly towards the end, and uh, when, when, when he begins his attack upon Christendom, um, it, it occurred to me that m this fellow Bishop Minster um, seems to be something of a bad dad, uh, a, a bad father figure mm -hmm. that um, he had loved and felt somewhat rejected by, uh, uh, you know, as, as at least Garth's reading of it, um, uh, indicating that, that as, as with all of us, the work of the Word of God was not yet finished in his life, perhaps. And at least that's one way of interpreting the last uh, year of his life. Uh, and I love Kierkegaard. I'm not trying to criticize him, you know. But, um, but, but so, so indicating both the profundity of his own journey with the Word of God and, and the unfinished business that we all face. And I uh, would love to hear your response to that. Garf, of course, um, as I'm sure you know, also you know, reflects psychologically on Kierkegaard's relationship with his own father. Um, I, I find Garth, in, in a way, he's not terribly sympathetic to Kierkegaard. I mean, he, he, he sees some of Kierkegaard's religious reading of his own life and experience as a kind of sort of religious justification after the fact of what had happened to him. Um, and I really think he's wrong about this. I mean, I, th I think if I'm right about the importance of that particular text for Kierkegaard actually at the time of his engagement, um, that seems to me to require that he did actually um, make his decisions at that point in a religious way in terms of his relationship to God, um, which the, the, the more recent biographers seem to me to 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 dismiss, you know, he, they, they see him as putting a religious interpretation on what he had done later. So uh, if I'm right about that, I think it actually perhaps a little bit uh, quite important for understanding, you know, the early stage of Kierkegaard's spiritual journey, which is, 
not all that well documented for us, and, and, and people speculate a lot about it. Um, yeah, I think, I, I mean, there is certainly is something, something very profound going on in terms of the father figure for Kierkegaard, you know, how he said in that quote, which is not ostensibly about himself, but it must reflect his own experience, you know, that the, the child's first deep impression of life is of the father's love for his child, you know. Not every child would say that. I mean, it's clearly, um, clearly it really was important to give God. And he dedicated these um, uh, discourses to his father after his father's death. Now, again, um, the bio certainly one of the biographers I, I was looking at, um, really, uh, and the biographers are not actually very interested in these upbuilding discourses. I think they're just not their kind of thing, and they're not what, so they haven't really looked hard at this material from the perspective of the biography. Um, I think it's very illuminating if you do do that. But um, the, the, the first couple of upbuilding discourses, which he published almost at the same time as either or, um, one of the biographers says, you know, this, this, these are just sort of um, <coughs> formal continuations of his father's religion as a kind of act of loyalty to his father. But they're, but they're not. I mean, they, they are deeply Kierkegaard's own experience. So I think the biographers are, actually haven't looked hard enough at this material. Um, and I really think, you know, this whole difficult issue of Kierkegaard's relationship to his father comes through in some of these texts, which have not really been um, seen bi bi biographically and therefore not fed into the psychological reading, which I kind of find difficult to do for myself because I'm not a psychologist, you know, it's not my field. Um, but I mean, it's a very interesting comment. Thank you. Yeah. I just have a uh, comment and a question, both are short. Uh, the comment is about background for um, Kierkegaard's exegesis here, and I think the only uh, clear source that comes to mind uh, for me is Luther in emphasizing that this text is written to you, mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. personally. I mm -hmm. think Luther mm -hmm. is an yeah. emphasis there. Yeah. Um, and my question is just about um, the relation of this James text, um, its importance for Kierkegaard, and then um, the role it might play in his un understanding of upbuilding and scriptural commentary and upbuilding in, in general and how those would relate. And I would love it if you could speculate on how those things interrelate. How this text relates to his, to his exegesis, to how he does exegesis? Is how he does exegesis yeah. and how he thinks about upbuilding. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems to me that actually, you know, what, the impressive thing when you look hard at these discourses, and, and very often you have to look hard to see quite how he's doing the exegesis. He doesn't make a great point of saying, you know, how the exegesis works. He, he kind of um, draws the conclusions from it. But if you look hard at the exegesis, I was really quite impressed by this, um, as I hadn't when I first looked at the discourses, um, the, the sort of uh, interpenetration of his exegesis of the text um, and, you know, his famous kind of insight into human psychology, um, which is connected with his own experience, but of course goes beyond his own experience. Um, so I think a sort of, um, uh, and of course, a, uh, you know, a concern for spiritual upbuilding. It's, it's very, I think he's very sincerely in these discourses simply trying to help anyone who reads them um, on in their, their Christian journey um, and drawing on his own experience to, to do that um, uh, in a way generalizing his own experience. But I think, I think the way, I mean, it's typical of God, isn't it? But you know, the way he um, envisages a number of different typical persons, different categories of persons. And so, you know, if you, that's where you're starting. This is how you um, proceed, as it were, to uh, appropriating the text. Um, it's, um, it's extremely skillfully done. And I think this blend of, 
of exe straightforward exegesis. It's very straightforward. It's just reading the text, thinking about the logic of it. I think sometimes he gets it wrong, but you know, um, one is bound to disagree with that sometimes. Um, he's terribly, you see, I actually, one thing in, going on in Kierkegaard, I think, is that he, he never wants to admit that there's any difficulty in understanding what a text means. Um, because behind it is this hermeneutic that debating about what it means is a distraction. It's clear what it means. The difficulty is appropriating it, putting it into practice. Um, so uh, uh, he never actually, you know, he never actually says, well, you know, what does this mean? It could mean this, it could mean that. That's the kind of stuff he doesn't like in biblical scholarship. He never, he never debates different interpretations. He just goes straight in with, with his own interpretation. Uh, but it's always a very well thought out interpretation. Uh, the combination of that with the psychological insight, with his own experience and, uh, you know, the kind of... Uh, desire to lead people on in their spiritual journey. I, I find it very, very impressive. Um, I, I'm sure you're absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right about Luther, and of course, uh, Kierkegaard loves, loves Luther, really. I mean, what he hates is the sort of degenerate Lutheranism of his time. And on the faith and works thing, of course, Kierkegaard has this lovely passage where he said, you know, if Luther came back today, he would love the epistle of James. He would see that, that the epistle of James is exactly what is needed now to, to stir this this kind of degenerate Lutheranism, which has taken Luther's faith alone to mean you don't need about works, you know, your faith's so okay, you forget about works, which was not what Luther himself meant. Um, but, you know, he, Luther would have appreciated James if he'd come back to early 19th century Copenhagen. This is really a comment, not a question. Uh, but let me just say first, thank you for a powerful and moving talk. I think I'd noticed some of the autobiographical elements, but I, I didn't really see the depth and power there. And you really uh, opened that up. And I'll never read those discourses the same way again. One comment I just want to make about the notion that you spoke about briefly, that Kierkegaard had this struggle to come to understand what he had taken to be a punishment, to be God's perfect gift. And it, it just struck me as you were talking that this fits perfectly with Kierkegaard's thoughts on punishment generally, uh -huh. especially in the later writings. Uh -huh. there, there, there are sort of two strands. I mean, Kierkegaard on one side continually says, God always wills your good. And so when he chastens you, you should be glad. You should be happy. You should welcome that. You shouldn't fear God's chastening. On the other hand, he does have passages where he sort of warns about, your, you know, the danger of damnation. But I think the way he reconciles those is that he has the same sort of view. And if I can refer to C.S. Lewis, whom we're going to celebrate here in a few weeks with another conference, <laughs> Lewis has this notion that damnation or hell is God's love and mercy as well, that it's God's final gift to those who could not endure his presence. And I think really Kierkegaard has the same view, that when he warns us about the danger of damnation, he's warning us about the danger of having our own way, of God's mm. allowing us. Uh, while God himself, for Kierkegaard, there's no trace of what I would call retributivism. Mm -hmm. In his view of God and divine justice and divine love, it's all God's graciousness and gift all the way down. And that fits perfectly, I think, with, with what you said about his own personal experience and the way he came to construe. And I, I just thought it was very powerful to connect his sort of more general thoughts on punishment with those personal experiences. So thank you. Th th thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad of, uh, of that sort of... Uh, connection you, you've made. Yes, I think that's, that's very helpful. There's also something kind of quite Lutheran. It's, it's kind of a bit like Luther's strange work and proper work, you know. God has to appear to be um, um, angry. In a sense, he really is angry, but, but behind it, there is always God's proper work, his, his, his love. Um, and I mean, the, the other thing, it's actually a rather difficult passage, what, what, quite what he means in the passage I quoted about punishment, but one of the things I think he's saying is that um, if you think uh, that, you know, I've done wrong, God has punished me, and that's, that's it, you're actually presuming 
that something you can do can take care of it. You know, you can, you can take the, it's like if you go to prison, you take the punishment and then nobody should hold it against you anymore. Um, and it's, it's much more serious than that. It's not something you can uh, just do something yourself. It's, it requires God's, God's, uh, God's action in your life to transform you from the person who deserved punishment to, to the new person. Are there any other comments? We have time. Make your way. If not, then I think, uh, from what I understand, Kierkegaard would not allow me to say that we have been treated with a good and perfect gift, but we've been treated with an almost good and perfect gift. So let us express our appreciation. Thank you.